Hello and thanks for joining us here on Encore. Coming up on today's show. Stories, secrets and subjective takes on history and the roots of religion. Marcel Theroux packs it all into his latest novel, The Secret Books. The author has carried out a literary investigation into a spiritual mystery which takes the reader from a swimming pool in South London to 19th century Paris with the help of some Russian spies. Marcel's in the studio to tell us more. Marcel Theroux, thank you so much for joining My us. My pleasure. Now, your latest novel, The Secret Books, does contain a couple of secrets. It's also a meditation on stories and the art of storytelling. You say that the world we inhabit is only a story we tell. Why do you think we need stories as humans so much? I think it's probably hardwired into our DNA. I think we, we use stories to make sense of our surroundings. And as I was writing the book, and as I became... I've always been fascinated with storytelling. It struck me that... Uh, we generally think of stories as benign, as good things, but I started to feel that actually the stories have a shadow side. They can be negative, they can be used to deceive, to hurt people. And unfortunately, this seems truer than ever. Well, OK, I want to ask you to read a short passage from the book. And now this is the beginning of the book, which explains a little bit about how you approached the writing of it and your relationship with sure. stories. The problem I kept encountering was that fiction, which I had used for consolation all my life, had somehow lost its charm. Whenever I read a novel, I found myself resisting the necessary conspiracy between writer and reader. I was inhabited by a spiteful internal heckler who would utter a flat denial after every assertion of fact. Hale knew, before he had been in Brighton three hours, that they meant to murder him. No, he didn't. In the latter days of July, in the year 1850, a most important question was for ten days hourly asked in the cathedral city of Barchester. No, it wasn't. The weak magic of novels was powerless before this malcontent's jeering non-cooperation. There seemed to be nothing special any more about the enchantments of fiction. On the contrary, in every area of human life, someone was trying to tell a story. Sports commentators, politicians, revolutionaries, religious leaders, business people, accountants, advertisers, actors, all were peddling selective and self-serving interpretations of the world. I told my wife I no longer believed anything I read in a newspaper, and she said I was driving her nuts. Well, you managed to reconcile <laughs> yourself with writing, at the very least, and publish this book. Now, you were speaking at the Shakespeare and Company bookshop about the secret books. Here's what the audience had to say. <laughs> It's like a, a detective story in a dream. Thought-provoking, kind of enchanting that stays with you, makes you think. This particular event is important to me because I'm from India and the book is about espionage, about bohemian culture in Paris in the 19th century and the character also travels to India. So I'm very curious to know what it's all about and to meet the author. Keep writing great, great works, and uh, you know, readers will enjoy them. Just thank you for sharing your thoughts and your mind with us. I think when an artist does that, it is really speaking from their soul. Thank you for having the courage to write because it's not easy, as I know. And uh, I hope that uh, I can meet you in person someday and discuss some of these themes. Enthusiastic. That was really there. nice, yeah. yeah. Now, that lady mentioned espionage. That's right. The protagonist of this book, Nicholas Naltovich, is involved in the world of Russian intelligence in the 19th century. That's right. In Paris, and he was a real person. Now, intrigue featuring Russian spies feels very current right now. Did you set out to write a book that would chime with the headlines? I absolutely didn't. And I handed the book, the finished manuscript, in two years ago when fake news wasn't even a term that anyone used. So... The, uh, the strange resonance the book has, has, has is, I find, spooky, actually. The book emerged from an obsession I had 
with a strange piece of biblical apocrypha, the story that Jesus in his missing year, in the years of his, before he began his ministry, might have gone to India to, and studied Buddhism. And I realized that I traced this uh, apocryphal tale to a book which was published in Paris, which I brought to show you, which was published in Paris in 1894. This is the original Unknown Life of Jesus Christ, published in 1894 by one Nicholas Notovich. And in that book, Notovich publishes the text of a gospel that he says he found in a monastery in Ladakh and translated with the help of a Buddhist monk. And the text of this gospel describes how Jesus traveled to India during his uh, young manhood, studied Hinduism and Buddhism, became a very high ranking Buddhist adept, uh, achieved some sort of enlightenment and then traveled back to Galilee to begin the ministry that's familiar to us from the Bible. And I thought that is an absolutely astonishing story. Why don't we know more about that? Why don't we know more about Nicholas Notovich? Could it possibly be true? And, and if it wasn't, why would anyone tell such a story? And in my researches about Notovich, I think I, I, I no one will ever know, for, uh, to be, there will never be 100% certainty about his reasons or indeed whether Jesus went to India during his gap years. <laughs> But uh, I, I think the likelihood is that Notovich wrote that book as a response to it, it, that it, it was a, a form of forgery and it was a response to currents in France at the time, particularly uh, anti-Semitic propaganda that was emerging from the Russian secret police. I wanted to uh, bring that up, actually. In fact, the, the rise of anti-Semitism in both uh, France and Russia was ascribed to another text which features in your book as well, and that was, you know, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, Zion. which right. became, obviously, had huge consequences in terms of the pogroms and everything. What were you trying to say about belief systems in general there? I think I was trying to say that it was tied to what I was saying about story, that... We think of stories as these wonderful benign instruments for understanding and communicating with each other. They can also be deeply toxic. And I want, I suppose, as a novelist and someone who creates stories for a living, I wanted to show the machinery of story from the inside and to flag up how easy it is to deceive that all the tools that a novelist uses to enchant a reader can be used to deceive or blind people or whip people up into a frenzy. I mean, of course... What I also wanted to do was tell a ripping yarn because I thought, you know, this story was so amazing. The idea of a young Russian adventurer traveling through India at the time of the great game, discovering in an Indiana Jones type fashion, this lost manuscript, bringing it back, having a moment when and in, this really happened. It was a bestseller and people took his claim seriously and thought perhaps we do need to reconsider the roots of the historical Jesus. Perhaps there are, perhaps there are Buddhist currents in Christianity. I, I thought that what an exciting moment. And then of course, the ferment of Paris in the 1890s, there was a kind of proto war on terror going on. And, um, and then in the latter part of the book, how the 19th century shades into the 20th and then the long dark tale of the protocols turns into fascism and Nazism. Mm -hmm. Now, you allude there in, in the reading to falling out of love with fiction and having this difficult relationship with a fact as well, saying you struggle to suspend your disbelief about certain things. But as a reader, there must be some writers or some books which manage to snare you, which manage to convince you and get you. There absolutely are, you know, and I, and I love fiction and it's always hard to know when, when and, and you, uh, every reader knows in their bones when, when, that, when that spell has been cast. And I, I, for me, a, a part of it is also um, feeling some presence of the author. I think when an author, when, I, I like to have a, be, have a sense of conspiracy with the author. I like to feel, and I like to feel that the author is uh, treating me as an equal somehow uh, so so there are certain you know the, uh, uh, you know everyone's different um, some people I, I did flirt with writing this as a straight piece of historical fiction one day in 1887 nicholas notovich knocked on the door of heaven you know that kind of thing and that but that didn't sort of catch fire with me i wanted to it, my book is slightly more elaborate but i wanted to I wanted to establish a, a sense, an equal relationship with my reader and mm. draw them in that way. There's certainly a bit of you in there, I think. Now, the opposite of fiction could be maybe considered journalism. You've done quite a bit of that, specifically. <laughs> well, I <hope> so. <laughs> TV reports. Now, you focused a lot on post-Soviet Russia in mm. these documentaries. With the World Cup starting uh, this month, what do you think this will do for the country's image abroad? Well, you know, I think that... 
you know, I have this sort of um, long love affair with Russia. I've noticed that everyone, when people write books about Russia, it tends to be Russia, mafia, state, Lenin's tomb. You know, it usually has death or something awful in the title. I absolutely love Russia. I love going to Russia. I find the, uh, it's such an exciting, vast place. I think it, it can only be good for people to go and meet Russian people. Uh, Russian people, are, they're... You know, they're generally speaking very proud, of hospitable, patriotic, uh, at welcome visitors in an amazing way. And I think people will feel the warmth of Russian hospitality. That's, I've got both fingers crossed for that. What I don't want to see is ugly scenes on the terrace. There are, uh, as in every country, a minority of idiots. Uh, I don't want to see them hog the headlines. I want people to, who go to Russia to experience that warmth and generosity of Russian people and come back thinking... Russia is not its government. OK, so perhaps some new Russia files to uh, be created there. So. Now, we're finishing with something literary as well. We asked for your cultural tip of the moment, and you've pointed us in the direction of the Bodleian Library in Oxford, hosting an exhibition based on the work of Tolkien, the writer. Why should we be checking that one out? We've got it because Tolkien is an evergreen writer. You know, this is a guy who was an Oxford don who spent his time making up elvish languages and was the last person anyone would pick to be a massive literary success. But Amazon have just announced that they're going to adapt Lord of the Rings again shortly. It's only just been in the cinemas. It feels like it was last week to me. They're spending a billion dollars bringing it to the small screen. So there's going to be lots and lots more Tolkien around in the ether. This is an exhibition of his paintings, uh, of his uh, watercolours, of his letters, of his diaries, showing the genesis of Middle Earth. There hasn't been anything like it, I think, since the 1960s. So it's a, really, it's a good chance to kind of remind yourself of the extraordinary, weird, vivid imagination out of which this arose. OK, fantastic. That's one to check out. Marcel, thank you so much for joining pleasure. us today. Here's a glimpse of Tolkien, the maker of Middle Earth, which is currently on show at the Bodleian Library in Oxford. Remember to check out our website and we're also on Twitter and Facebook. There's more news coming up on France 24 after this.